Thank you. <coughs> we go to uh, start. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, good evening to uh, all the attendees who are present. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this uh, today's webinar. It will be focusing on the COVID-19 experiences and challenges in fragile context and uh, building resilience to future so to future shocks. My name is uh, Amjad Bashar. I'm the uh, chief of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction for Africa. I'm based in Nairobi and I will be moderating uh, this session uh, this afternoon. So before I start, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, all the attendees have been muted by default. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, please use the chat box or the Q&A box and uh, at the end of the webinar, we will, uh, at the end of the, the presentations and interventions, will be uh, taking on those questions and comments and sharing them with the experts that we have. I'm really pleased to have with me a, a very high level panel and uh, they'll be discussing with us the far reaching impacts of the COVID-19 crisis uh, as it deepens the existing inequalities and vulnerabilities of large populations of developing countries. Uh, fragile context in particular or conflict affected uh, con countries in particular have a set of challenges uh, for them that uh, need to be addressed uh, that continue that have to be addressed even in the context of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, that being said uh, what I would like to do is first of all to uh, very much welcome the high level uh, discussions and panels that we have First of all, I'm uh, privileged to introduce the Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, Ms. Mami Mizipuri. I'm also pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Ronald Jackson, who is the new head of the Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery for Building Resilience Team in UNDP. Uh, this, uh, this webinar is arranged uh, in collaboration between uh, UNDRR and UNDP. Um, I'm also pleased to uh, welcome uh, my friend, uh, Ms. Katie Peters, who is the Senior Research Fellow at the Overseas Development Institute. And uh, she is leading the portfolio uh, on uh, disaster risk reduction in fragile and conflict affected uh, context, and also often looks at the, the relationship between climate risk and conflict as well. I'm also <clears throat> pleased to welcome uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Henry Williams, who's the Director of National Disaster Management Agency, uh, who's the, also the focal point for disaster risk reduction from Liberia. We look forward to learning about Liberia's experiences. I'm also pleased to have with us uh, His Excellency Dr. Jassim Abdelaziz Al Falahi, who's the Deputy Minister of Environment. Environmental Affairs from the Ministry of Health and Environment in Iraq. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you sir, with us. And uh, last but not least, uh, the Director General from the National Institute for Disaster Management in, uh, from uh, in Mozambique, uh, Luisa Mekwe, who is new to her post and it's a pleasure to have her with us here. So um, I'd like to begin by uh, uh, having uh, uh, first of all, uh, the Special Representative of the Secretary General uh, provide opening remarks and uh, she will also be followed by uh, Mr. Ronald Jackson with his opening remarks and then we will move to the country cases uh, to learn more about the actual um, discussions and the actual challenges and hopefully achievements that have been uh, uh, reached in, at the international level. Um, uh, so I'll begin with uh, Ms. Uh, the SRSG. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Ms. Mizuturi has uh, engaged often with the ODI uh, and she recently was in a, an interview with ODI where she discussed, uh, uh, underlined that fragility is a reality for many countries and so we cannot include, exclude that when we look at disaster risk reduction policies. 
and uh, she em emphasized that fragile contexts are now dealing with a global disaster in the form of this biological uh, hazard of COVID-19. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Nizaduri, uh, the SRG, and uh, to tell her, give, share with us her thoughts and her opening remarks as regards uh, disaster risk reduction, fragility, and uh, conflict. Uh, SRSG, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Abashar. It is a great pleasure to open this webinar co-hosted by UNDRR and UNDP. As uh, mentioned by Amjad, uh, Mr. Ronald Jackson, the new head of the disaster risk reduction and recovery team of UNDP, has been our close friend since Ronald's time as the head of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. And with uh, Ms. Katie Peters, we have been working together in advocating the issue of DRR in the context of fragility, including launching an important ODI report on this theme at the Global Platform last year in Geneva. I congratulate Ms. Luisa Meke as the new head of the National Institute of Disaster Management of Mozambique. I remember fondly meeting your predecessor during my mission to your country last September in the aftermath of the cyclones Idai and Kenneth, which brings me to the theme of today's webinar. Because even before COVID-19, we were living in a world where extreme weather events related to climate emergency were killing people and eroding development gains and affecting the most vulnerable people, including in the context of fragility. Now, with the arrival of a pandemic, existing vulnerabilities and inequalities are exacerbated with a tremendous impact on disaster risk management. Biological hazards such as pandemics were included in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction when it was adopted in 2015. This was a result of a very strong push from member states which had experienced Ebola, SARS, MERS and H1N1. Ever since, there were multiple warnings that we would see a pandemic such as COVID-19 coming, but sadly, prevention and preparedness was not enough. COVID-19 became a public health disaster, which quickly turned into a global socioeconomic disaster. According to the 2019 Global Assessment Report for Disaster Risk Reduction, the GAR report, launched a year ago, biological hazards such as COVID-19 affect people at all levels of society with no respect to borders. This is what we are seeing and living through, but importantly, as in all disasters, the virus is not affecting everyone equally. It is affecting, once again, the most vulnerable people in vulnerable states. COVID-19 has laid bare some significant issues. First, the pandemic is a stark reminder of the systemic nature of the risk we face, and therefore the approach should be also systemic and holistic. We need to recognize the multiple ways in such outbreaks can have a ripple effect across sectors of society and lead to the breakdown of systems, especially in fragile contexts. This is why DRR measures need to be multi-hazard and multi-sectoral, offering innovative approaches in coherence with climate change, biological losses, and conflict pr prevention, among many other global challenges. Secondly, COVID-19 has also highlighted the importance of risk governance and the foundation for good risk governance in every country is to have a robust national strategy for DRR, which is target E of the Sendai framework. In this context, the GAR report notes that fragile and complex contexts, especially where there is significant internal and cross-border migration due to war, famine, and social disruption, present a particular set of challenges for national and local risk reduction act actors and to achieve integrated risk governance. Growing attention should also be placed on what is called the humanitarian development and peace building nexus, the triple nexus. DRR must be embedded in all development projects for their sustainability, but that's not enough. 
the aura must also be embedded in all humanitarian actions. And this is important, again, for countries in fragile context. With this in mind, UNDRR led a global consultative process to develop recommendations on scaling up DRR in humanitarian contexts. Many humanitarian actors of the UN system, NGOs, and think tanks were involved, and the objective of the recommendations is to make humanitarian development peace collaboration possible through scaling up disaster risk reduction. It outlines ways to make disaster risk reduction integral to humanitarian projects at the country level, particularly in fragility, protracted crisis, taking a conflict sensitive approach. I am well aware that the African continent and the Arab states are still in the middle of the response to COVID-19, but it is never too early to start looking at how to build resilience and recover better. This tragedy should be a wake up call for all of us to understand that prevention saves lives and in order to prevent better, we have to address the root causes of disasters, steering our world towards a more sustainable and inclusive path. I'd like to close by thanking His Excellency, Mr. Henry Williams, Executive Director of National Disaster Management of Liberia, and His Excellency, Dr. Jassim Abdulaziz Al-Falai, Deputy Minister of Environment Affairs in the Ministry of Health and Environment of Iraq, for joining us today at MIST your very, very busy schedule. And I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, SRZ, and thank you also for reminding us that biological hazards have been in the Sendai framework uh, from uh, since 2015. And also for the points that you raised, including the systemic nature of risk and the need to address it in a systemic way as well and uh, for pointing out the importance of risk governance and ensuring that national uh, disaster risk reduction strategies do have uh, a strong, uh, strong mainstreaming of biological assets. And of course, uh, finally, the importance of integrating disaster risk reduction from the beginning, from the humanitarian response. And I think that's uh, of critical importance and remains to be a missing gap uh, that we need to do more on. Thank you very much, uh, again, SRSG. Uh, Mr. Jackson, can I come to you, please, for your uh, remarks? Thank you very much, uh, Sir Moderator, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you on the experiences, challenges, and examples on addressing COVID-19 recovery in fragile contexts. I'm also delighted to, to partner with UNDRR, and as the SRSG has said, I've been a, a friend of UNDRR, not just since my time at SEDEMA, but dating back to my role as head of the National Emergency Management Agency for Jamaica. So a long, long relationships which were, were pivoting in my, my new context as the head of the DRT. I'm also delighted to join with the esteemed colleagues on the panel. Um, we recently had an engagement with ODI, Katie Peters, looking at this issue around the multidimensionality of risk and how we as actors in the disaster reduction community need to look more at the tools that are available to us to begin to advance the agenda for much more risk-informed development. As per the SG's report, COVID-19 exhibits multidimensional impact on countries and on societies. The COVID-19 outbreak with its health and socioeconomic impacts is affecting all segments of the population and is particularly detrimental to the most vulnerable groups. The social and economic crisis created by the COVID-19 pandemic further risk increasing inequality, exclusion, discrimination, and unemployment in the medium and long term. COVID-19 has added complexity to regions that are already reeling from droughts, floods, conflict and displacement, as well as political and economic crises, among others. East Africa is plagued by the desert locust invasion not seen in 70 years, and Lake Victoria has recorded high water levels in 170 years due to heavy rains and flooding. For some countries, COVID-19 has come at a time 
when they were just getting their feet after a catastrophic event such as Cyclone Idai and Kenneth in South Africa, which mostly devastated Mozambique and Malawi. In our Asia Pacific region, UNDP is currently working on a study on lessons learned for COVID-19 socioeconomic recovery from past disasters. The study is already revealing that for fragile states in the region, the additional pandemic event adds to the systemic risk landscape. In this region, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Pakistan are among the top 25 fragile states. Similar to natural hazards, pandemic risks are likely to increase inequalities and further burden already vulnerable groups. There is also a risk that conflict parties are quick to capitalize on various opportunities arising from the policy response to the crisis, which compl complicate peace and crisis management efforts. In many fragile countries and regions, an increasingly hostile climate, growing intensity, but also exposure to disaster events, environmental degradation, and sometimes limited capacities for risk management, all pose serious risk for the socioeconomic re recovery, elaborated in the UNDP COVID-19 socioeconomic recovery framework. The combined and interactive risk have become systemic and produces multiple complex hardships. They not only make it impossible for the affected communities to practice physical distancing, but they also take the much needed attention and resources away from the affected communities. At the institutional level, national and local government planning emergency preparedness and service delivery systems are being tested in an unprecedented way. This reveals additional urgent actions that still must be taken to build resilience. In this regard, actions taken today for responding to the COVID-19 crisis and recovering from it can also present a future opportunity to strengthen disaster preparedness and response for future shocks and crises. Recovery in this regard needs to include a wide range of socioeconomic interventions that help affected households and communities to build their resilience and their capacities to COVID-19, but also future risk and crises. We use the term building back better and COVID-19 is testing the robustness of national and local government planning, emergency preparedness and service delivery systems in an unprecedented way with a view to building back better and resilient recovery efforts need exist to integrate environmental green solutions into national crisis response and recovery plans and investments. This can help to manage converging risk, build the resilience of crisis affected communities and advance resilient forms of recovery. This can also build on the success stories which countries across the various regions have achieved in mainstreaming sustainability and to recover from conflict and displacement in some regions over the decades. UNDP has some examples of working in crisis countries. For example, in Zimbabwe, where we've worked in economic fragility, it should also be taken into account that Zimbabwe has also been hit hard by Cyclone Adair last year, and the most affected communities and COVID-19 threatens to stall or undo the efforts gained in recovery. In this regard, UNDP is supporting farmers by engaging in private sector an authority, with private sector and the authorities in facilitating information flow within the agricultural supply chain. In Iraq, UNDP has supported the mainstreaming of climate change, sustainable energy, and nature-based solutions in their socioeconomic recovery framework. And in the Sudan, the socioeconomic impacts are mounting from the COVID-19. And here, UNDP has supported solar solutions to be integrated into the new socioeconomic framework while helping partners exploring ways to activate the nascent National Solar Fund as a means of their green recovery. I offer my thanks, colleagues, to UNDR for inviting UNDP to be a part of this very important engagement and for organizing this event. I look forward to hearing from the panelists, sharing their lessons learned, good practices and challenges and experiences on COVID-19 preparedness, response and recovery efforts in a systemic 
risk environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ronald. Thank you also for underlining the socioeconomic impacts and uh, the way they could lead to of the pandemic and uh, and the danger of increasing inequalities. And uh, also for pointing out the the complications that might arise in uh, deterring uh, or exacerbating conflict, actually, uh, by complicating any peace negotiations or peace agreements. I appreciate that. And thank you also for the country examples you provided on Sudan and Iraq. I look forward to uh, getting uh, more in depth of the Iraq one since we have the Deputy Minister from Iraq with us here. Um, I would like to now uh, move to uh, Katie Peters. And uh, um, Katie is, is a really well-known expert on the intersection of natural hazards and related disasters and climate change. Uh, uh, from, and she's been very active and a, and a good colleague that we've worked with in ODI. So Katie, if you could maybe put us in context before we dig down into the national examples to provide us uh, with your, con uh, your considerations or what you think about the implications of disaster risk reduction in fragile context with the added layer of, of the COVID-19 uh, having now we have, which, which we now have to take into account. So I give you the floor, Katie. Thank you very much. Um, well, first, let me say a, a massive thank you to our esteemed government representatives on the panel and also to UNDR and UNDP for taking the initiative to convene this webinar. I want to start by saying that it is possible to paint quite an optimistic picture of how the pandemic might create opportunities for peace. So, for example, the UN Secretary General called for a global ceasefire in March. And we did see evidence, certainly in Colombia, Cameroon and the Philippines, of armed groups temporarily violence. We've also seen new humanitarian collaborations and diplomatic opportunities, for example, where countries are providing support to states through medical supplies and technical advice. And we've also seen examples of China providing assistance to a number of African countries. And we've also seen local responses to the pandemic prompting intergroup cooperation and strengthened social cohesion. So there's a lot of positives to take, but there's actually another story to tell. Unfortunately, the pandemic exposes flaws in the management of what arguably are quite predictable risks. In Brazil, for example, people can be seen hanging out of their balconies, banging pots, and that's a form of social protest that's been adapted, conformed to social distancing restrictions. And we've seen people really expressing their dissatisfaction with the government's handling of the crisis. ACLED, for example, show that contrary to many predictions, levels of political violence have not changed significantly since the outbreak of COVID-19. But, however, the pandemic has altered the reasons for violence. And world over, we're witnessing changing patterns of protests and violence on the street for a whole variety of different reasons. So, for example, economic hardship has led to demonstrations in Algeria, Morocco and South Africa. In the Middle East, we've seen the increasing demonstrations over the government's handling of the pandemic, as in Iran. And in Bangladesh and Pakistan, there's been a number of demonstrations organised by unions and labour groups who have been impacted by the virus. Now, in context with pre-existing active violent and armed conflict, the, consequence of, the consequences of the pandemic have been even more severe. And for people that are living under the control of armed groups, they've suffered disproportionately. For example, violence limits access to healthcare, it can constrain supply chains, it can lead health professionals to flee for safer areas, and entire communities can be cut off from health services. But the honest reality is that we've always known managing disaster risk in contexts of conflict is much more challenging and COVID-19 is no different. Part of the problem is that disaster risk reduction is based on a set of assumptions that don't always hold true in conflict contexts. For example, that there is a functioning and effective state that can be used as an entry point for national policy, or that there is a strong social contract between states and citizens or that governments will seek to protect all citizens equally. And although it's, not, although it's common knowledge that is often not the case, rarely are those realities grappled with on plans, discussions and strategies to advance DRR. What we need to do is to better support governments 
and other actors that are working in areas of conflict. And in practice, that means providing financial, technical and practical support on how to adapt existing disaster risk governance structures to support communities that are at risk of both hazards, COVID and violent and armed conflict. Now to understand how COVID-19 is playing out in fragile contexts, we need to look at themes of power, politics and risk governance. Now these themes are relevant for COVID, but they're also relevant for other natural hazard related disasters. The first theme is power. We know that power relations are certainly changing as a result of the dynamic, but certainly not in favour of those living under conditions of armed conflict. For example, there's been a reduction of forces that are mandated to protect civilians in South Sudan and Mali, and that's in locals becoming more vulnerable to both state and non-state actors. In Colombia, for example, lockdown restrictions have prevented movement as a form of seeking protection and also hindered local peace building efforts. And ACLED report an increase in violence against civilians during the lockdown in a whole number of areas across Colombia. And power is also being wielded to exploit marginalized groups and to accentuate pre-existing inequalities. For example, hate speech and violence against marginalized groups have been seen across the world including, for example, towards LGBTQI plus people in Uganda, towards Muslims in India and Cambodia, and also towards Jewish people across the United States. And we've also seen individuals and families who are subject to multiple and protracted displacement bearing the brunt of those discriminations. The second theme is the politics of disasters. Now, this is something, again, that disaster scholars have been talking about since the 1970s. Now, in many contexts, it's actually state responses to the pandemic that have promoted clashes, either, for example, as governments have abruptly enforced new regulations or as citizens have rioted and protested against lockdown measures. In Cote d'Ivoire, for example, multiple violent demonstrations were seen around testing centres in the capital, particularly in opposition areas, because locals were concerned that the centres would spread the virus in their communities, even though that wasn't the case. And in other contexts, authorities have actually been able to seize opportunities to solve contentious political issues through excessive state force, manipulation of elections, or clamping down on opposition groups. And it's actually those less, vis less visible but potentially more impactful consequences of the outbreak that we need to be looking at. Governments, for example, will consider whether holding an election or postponing them will give them extreme strategic advantage. Now, that's as relevant to the United States as it is to West African states. Holding elections amidst the crisis will likely result in lower voter turnout. It may restrict public campaigning and it may derail electoral processes such as voter registration. And the third theme is risk governance. Now, I would argue that the pandemic has revealed the need to shift our conceptions of disaster risk governance away from single threats. A much deeper understanding is required of the way that risk governance regime intersect for concurrent threats. For example, the risk governance regime for a pandemic threat does not operate in isolation, but in the context of multiple pre-existing and emerging shocks, including, for example, violence and conflict, but also climate variability and change, and increasingly an economic global downturn, and other natural hazards, as we've seen in the context of the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands over the past few months. Now, how each of those threats and hazards play out is determined by a whole set of different actors, laws, operations and terminology, and they each govern differently. Therefore, we need to recognise and work with multiple risk governance regimes. What does that mean in practice? Well, to deal with current and future threats, we need to expand our network of risk governance actors beyond those that we currently work with. The specific constellation of actors will vary depending on the context and the risk profile, but it could include, for example, much greater collaboration with health professionals to deal with pandemic threats, or peace building and conflict resolution actors to deal with violence and conflict. And there are many others, such as those working on cybersecurity or nuclear threats. So let me close by pointing to three opportunities moving forward. First, the disaster risk management community have much to offer globally in how we understand complex and systemic risk.
And we have to use the opportunity of the global pandemic to bolster pandemic preparedness in ways that address the complexity of 21st century risks. Second, we should be concerned about the implications that COVID is already having on national budgets and on overseas development assistance, including, for example, where emergency reserves have already been spent on the pandemic, despite the upcoming disaster season. But what we can do is to get behind calls for green and more resilient recovery and economic stimulus packages, and to make clear the case for enabling co-benefits for disaster resilience in a COVID-19 era. And that includes in context of social and violent conflict. And finally, I'd like to read you a quote from a UNDP report called Governing in an Age of Emergence. It says the pandemic can be understood as a warning sign a probe into the structural weaknesses of our existing systems. It shows how futile it is to insist on facing 21st century challenges with the institutions and methods of 20th century global governance. And this is the third and final opportunity. The disaster risk management community is well placed to take the lead in exploring the relationship between different risk governance regimes for concurrent threats. And that could reveal new insights into the trade-offs and the opportunities for leveraging greater coherence across risk management systems. And that, I believe, is the opportunity that we should be seeking to capitalise on from the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, uh, for your very uh, uh, well thought out presentation. And thank you for breaking it up into the three areas of uh, power, politics and risk governance and for the three opportunities that you mentioned. I think uh, we all see this as an opportunity. Uh, despite the disaster, we do see it as an opportunity to build back better and to uh, ensure that we address disaster risk in a, system, in a systemic way. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to go directly uh, to uh, Mr. Williams uh, to start uh, maybe digging, drilling a little bit deeper into the experiences that you've had. Uh, Mr. Williams, I lived in Liberia for two years. A uh, good part of my life I enjoyed there during the first war. And so I, I've, uh, I, I also know that there's a lot of lessons from the Ebola virus uh, that has occurred there in recent years and that uh, Liberia has been lauded for its uh, ability to uh, manage that crisis and I was wondering if there is anything that we could learn from the Ebola response in Liberia in this pandemic. Of course uh, we'd like to hear much more about your efforts uh, in addressing these, these challenges, uh, disasters, reduction, pandemics within the context of Liberia. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you Amjad. And um, I'm grateful to let's say the UNDP, UNDDR for considering me to be part of the panel in this important deliberation. Um, of course, we had the Ebola, and uh, there are really lessons that we are learned from the Ebola. Okay, for instance, um, when the COVID that came to Liberia in March, March 16, the Ministry of Health immediately galvanized all of the old actors, the doctors, nurses, etc., and some of the systems that were put in place we are readily brought on board. Um, but one thing I want to add to this um, is the political will. At the onset, our president became very, um, let's say, concerned and involved. And uh, he personally, um, let's say, took charge and um, he started to, he formed a committee on COVID, but before the health aspect, let me just give because I'm the head of the disaster management agency. Um, when it started before the, the president intervention, the, the my agency, um, let's say, formed a coordinating mechanism. And this coordinating mechanism, we put, um, we use clusters. Um, for instance, uh, we had the coordination cluster. 
we had a health cluster, we had a shelter cluster, food and non-food item cluster, and even included the, the private sector cluster that included the, 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 the private sector and even religious groups. So these were all part of the part of the system. We were having a, 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 let's say weekly meetings. And in fact, when the Ebola was at hand, there was a pandemic plan that was produced. So now this pandemic plan was reviewed and validated and it was part of the pandemic plan, the action plan, the plan of action that the health ministry or the IMS was using came from this pandemic plan. So my agency really played a part in putting the whole plan, plan together. So when this took place, when the president formed this, um, let's say the, the, the presidential tax force, we were operating by the IMS, the Incident Management, Management System. And this Incident Management System, it was, let's say, um, it was comprising of all of the sectors, all of the partners, including uh, the WHO, the CDC. And in fact, um, the CDC that played a great role in the Ebola, teaching, um, let's say, our experts in, let's say, issue like con contact tracing, et cetera, did the same. And the CDC and the WHO and all other partners were on board. And uh, in the IMS, we divided the IMS into two sectors, the steering committee and the technical committee. The technical committee could meet before and come out with their actions, which is transmitted to the IMS steering committee. So the IMS steering committee decides on issues and even situations and advises the president even for the state of emergency to be instituted, we advise the president, and even for it to be called off, we also give him that advice. So the incident management system is very vital to the process. Keying from the Ebola, there are a lot of um, mechanisms that we are put in place. Um, for instance, they also had this coordinating mechanism. Yeah. Of course, the, the, the incident management system is the main coordinating body. Yeah. It comprises of UN organizations, international organizations, ministers, and the private sector. So you could see that it is not only the government, it costs across. And even with the religious groups, we put the religious groupings and we even train them. That was one of the hallmarks. All of the sectors that we are dealing with, the private sector, the religious groups, they were drilled in COVID response because they were going into the communities, in their churches, etc., to carry the messages concerning the health protocols. So um, the religious aspect was there. And even the private sector, because we didn't want to leave them out. The private sector too was saying that they are important, and of course. Then the civil society, civil society too was part of the process because we are talking about political ramifications, etc. And um, you know, the civil society, they have to be on board in any developmental action or activities in your country. So they were also part of this. So now um, for the real operation, the IMS had this, um, let's say the coordination system, which as I said before, is comprising of all of the, the um, related entities. Then we, they had 
a psychosocial aspect. In the psychosocial aspect, we are psychosocial aspect and community engagement. So they are going into the communities um, even before ac actions are taken in the community. The psychosocial group gets into the community and tra tries to, let's say, um, if tensions are high or if um, there are a lot of denials, they get in to, 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 to dampen the atmosphere before we get in. So they are there. And it, in fact, even um, right now with the food distribution to, to communities, the psychosocial group is part of it and they are heading that. In fact, they are heading that, that sector. So we, we have the, um, our lab, of course, is um, not as sophisticated as in the Western world, but they are also trying. Um, so we have one major lab that's in Monrovia, and we are trying to, let's say, have two other sub labs in the counties. You know, we have 15 counties. So we are also trying, trying to put that to put that in place. So um, apart from the lab, we have the case management system. And the case management, they do monitoring and, and they take care of the POCs and also areas for quarantine. You know, um, I don't know, uh, but this is also let's say sort of unique to Liberia, maybe some other countries might have used this system. But for instance, when, when travelers, we are arriving at the airport, we have this precautionary center, the POCs, that all travelers who get in for them to be monitored, for them to be quarantined, etc. So apart from the quarantine, uh, areas, the POCs are also uh, uh, operating. And for the POCs, um, they were supporting, or they are, they are the supporting arm of the Ministry of Health, uh, making available treatment, uh, let's say options, etc. They do monitoring, they, they also look at that in the communities and also to see how patients are faring. etc. Then we also have you see they take care of issues like head washing in all public areas of the country. And and the public areas will really try to let's say target the market areas. We have facilities, public offices, etc. And even the checkpoints. And uh, just recently the president have mandated that all government buildings or government employees is mandatory that you wear masks before you enter the offices. If you do not, administrative measures will be taken against you. So that is strictly um, from the presidency. So to show that the political will is there. Okay, so um, another important um, component is the risk communication. This risk communication, they, they, they really work with the communities and there are a lot of activities that they carry on. And we have counties. And in the counties, we have a system where the counties are, let's say, headed by superintendents. So the superintendents do form part of the system and they have to coordinate activities from the counties to the central office in Monrovia. So for risk communications, they carry a lot of issues. For instance, um, one of the awareness um, methods they are using, um, flyers, stickers, et cetera. And even I want to say that my organization too is in the advisor of producing um, some, some flyers and some stickers that will say no max, no entry. And those will be put in market areas 
and who also use use them in um, in um, on the vehicles, on the vehicles, etc. So the enforcement of the public use of masks is one of the key things that the president. including helpful workers. Now we are talking about um, some issues that was brought about by others. Like for instance, um, in Liberia, some of the problems that we have inadequate health system, of course, because even though the Ebola um, scenario was there, but we are still really under the, the health that's a capability, yeah. so inadequate yeah. health system. And um, one other problem that we are facing to increase this, uh, let's say, virus is the behavior, behavioral actions, especially of the youth. The youth, it is difficult for them to, let's say, accept that this virus is existing. So that is another serious, yeah. serious problem. Uh, Mr. And Williams, also, yeah. Uh, um, if you can conclude, because I I want to come back to you later with some more questions. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I can give others a chance, and I'll get yeah, back okay. to you then with some more questions. Yeah. Okay. So let me just um, let's say conclude by um, looking at some some activities. Let's say just summary or intent measures user travelers or high exposed countries, we quarantine them, or high risk uh, uh, um, contacts, we quarantine them. We put them, if they are low, we put them in self-isolation self and we test on high, high risk contacts. For testing strategy, all suspected cases high and low, we, we, we test them. And um, voluntary testing too, we use that. So, um, I think I can stop so far for others to come uh, in and later yeah. Yeah, I can take in questions. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I think uh, w there's some questions that are, at least I have some for you, so I'll come back to you a bit later on that. And uh, thank you for pointing out the importance of political will, which is something we often get challenged with in disaster risk reduction often. Um, Dr. Jassim Al-Falahi, Deputy Minister of Environment, uh, may I give you the floor, please, uh, to take, uh, to give us the experiences from Iraq. You have to unmute uh, your computer. Yes. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for UNDP. Thank you for UNDRR for this uh, very important chance to share and to cooperate, collaborate, and to discuss one of the most important issues that we are all of us fa uh, facing globally, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Regarding the Iraqi environmental priorities to recover from impact of COVID-19, you know, in the situation of current widespread of global health uh, threat of COVID-19 and its severe um, uh, implications on all of the countries around the world, there were uh, uh, repercussions at all levels and uh, the political, economic, social, cultural, and media sectors, the environmental sectors facing the most severe impact by COVID-19 due to its interfere with all sectors. Therefore, it has become one of the most important requirements for redefining policies, action plans, and priorities for environmental action as well in the national, regional, and international level to be more resilient with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in current time and in the future. The most important environmental challenges caused by COVID-19 pandemic crisis, while many environmental challenges has been arise as a result of COVID-19, which require the redefining of national priorities as the following. One, health action, second, nature and biological diversity conservation, third, water and food security. 
health action first. The first case was diagnosed in Iraq was on uh, 24 February 2020. And this case was for a person come from the Iranian Republic, Islamic Republic of Iran. From the first time Iraqi government established the health committees one, the national crisis, what's called the Health National Crisis Committee, was formed and negated by the Minister of Health. Second, subcommittees has been formed in the uh, governorates, headed by the governor, and membership of all, uh, of all the relevant departments. The National Health and the Safety Committee, uh, National Health and Safety, and the safety committee was formed under the chairman of physics Excellency, the prime minister and related membership of the ministries and for the crisis cell committee submit its recommendations to the national health and the safety committee all these committees will work to coordinate with the who iraq adopted many restrictions and precautionary measures including the following uh, a cure few was imposed on 17 March uh, 2020. Schools and universities were was closed since 1 March 2020. Carrying out of expedition, all of uh, expeditions, uh, campaign for all re uh, regions, especially those with infections, recorded under the supervision of the CPR and team for civil defense volunteers, environmental directorates in Baghdad and the provenance. Published the doctor's phone number for consultation or over the phone. Initiate e-learning at universities and schools to complete the school uh, uh, curriculum and prevent loss of academic year. Broadcast workshops and seminars on electrics platform since uh, such as Zoom, Google Classroom, and etc. International and domestic aviation has been closed since 15 March 2020, except for conduction trips to Iraq, outside Iraq, in coordination with our embassies in their countries, after providing places to quarantine for a period of at least 14 days. By imposing a curfew, time has been gained to strengthen the health system, and as you know, the health system in Iraq has been uh, really suffering a lot from a decade of war and uh, uh, security and stability and also the uh, terrorist uh, challenges. But in spite of all of this, the health system in Iraq, uh, we start to establishing healthcare center as well as strengthening laboratories in Baghdad and in the provenance from the beginning of the pandemic really we concentrate upon the laboratories because you know in pandemic the the most important things is test test and test and uh, really we start to rehabilitation of uh, uh, already exist the medical centers and the hospital although the challenges was really serious and huge but we try our best in order to occupy the impact of this pandemic all over our sectors, especially the health center. The security forces control the price of food commodi uh, commodities, uh, vegetables and the fruit and the prevent price like hikes. Health team and the Ministry of Health recorded daily uh, a very good recovery rank, more than 2,500 persons in coordination with the WHO. We have about 70% the recovery percent from all the uh, all recorded cases, which is a very good indication, which reflects positive progress for Iraq and also in, in controlling the uh, COVID-19. As you know, this is the first time the world really suffering or facing this uh, huge crisis with uh, COVID-19, and you know. Uh, I think the medical system, the medical of the health system in Iraq was not in use. Uh, it's really related to the uh, establishment of Iraqi, uh, as, as Iraq as a, as a state since 1920. And you know, the Ministry of Health, uh, now really the, the age of Ministry of Health was 100 years. 
we have a very good experience and we have a very good uh, medical uh, experience, but really we are in need to support, especially in the field of capacity building, really uh, we are in need for much more tests and, and regarding the laboratory uh, infrastructures and you know the environmental aspects of the COVID-19 was very important uh, regarding the wise management of the waste which is important both liquid and solid and the uh, disease controlling centers in the hospital was worth working carefully because the uh, medical staff they are really suffering from the highly infected because of uh, not well controlling the mechanism of the transportations of the of the COVID-19 virus. Now we have a very good experience with COVID-19 uh, initiations, transmissions, and the infection. But you know, at the beginning, really, there is much more confusion regarding the uh, the uh, the virus, the way of the transmission how to protect. Now we have a very good experience. At the beginning, really, we have uh, an incidence of infection of the medical staff. Now we are dealing with the wise management of the waste uh, of the patient and also for the uh, uh, of the medical staffs and the, of the hospitals. We start to have more than 22 uh, uh, new hospitals in order to expand the uh, the capacity of the hospitals for the inpatient capacity. We have 22 new hospitals with 150 uh, beds and with fully equipment, as you know, which is a very important for us and also it's a huge challenge for our people because we need to train a new staff in order to make all this an uh, uh, action. But till now we have, really we have a huge challenges regarding the increase in the incidence of the infection. Other sectors was the nature, biological diversity conservation. As you know, this is a very important and one of our priorities for the Ministry of Health and Environment. We are continuing to work on this principle for sustainable natures. The Ministry already started to establish network of national reserves starting from the sites of Altim, Dalmaj, as well as enhancing the concept of nature-based solution and ecosystem services because of these two concepts support the sustainability of nature and enhancing the social economic reality and the local population and support the indigenous communities and to promote traditional knowledge. Also, Ministry of Health and Environment focus on issue and increasing awareness and control of animal trafficking and supporting current global trend need adopt new control for animal trafficking, especially animal that can be considered a carrier of virus and disease and control their handling as required by public health requirements. And regarding water and food security, the issue of food and water security is considered one of the most important topics that have direct relation to environmental issue, uh, especially the topics of climate change, combating desertification, conservation of biological diversity. At the end, uh, the current crisis due to COVID-19 pandemic had uh, uh, implication on additional 2 million people in West Asia from food storage as well as exacerbating water stress and widening gap in the matter of uh, of dependence of import, uh, imported food, the uh, precautionary measures and restrictions on the transport region have prevent uh, quantities of food to reach local markets. The issue of lacking quantities of food not reaching the local market must be addressed by supporting the agricultural and water sector. The ministry will start implementing two projects founded by the Global Environmental Facilities, Jeff, and uh, Adaptation Fund, uh, and to increase the resilience of agricultural sectors in Iraq to impact uh, against the impact of climate change. At the end, thank you very much for all for this, uh, uh, this uh, opportunity. And really, for one minute, just I want to say that we are trying to be resilient in facing the, uh, the uh, the uh, coronavirus. As you know, the pandemic of COVID-19 was new and huge. Until now, we there is no um, anything clear regarding the, the end of this pandemic. So I think to be resilient, 
we should make more cooperation and coordination between all of our countries in order to make what's called a global measures to control and pandemic all national and regional work it's not sufficient but i think supporting the uh, united nation organization in cooperation with all these countries i think all parties should participate in order to control nobody can control the virus by by alone but it should be cooperated together thank you very much thank you very much uh, deputy minister and thank you for the last point on the importance of global cooperation and thank you also for sharing with us the um, how the health system is suffering in fragile contests and how uh, conflict uh, can actually deepen the weakness of the health system. Uh, thank you so much for that. Last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, um, Director General Luisa Mekwe from Mozambique. I know you are still in the midst of recovering and rebuilding uh, from the cyclone Idai, uh, and I'm hoping that's going well at this time. I'm sure you're in the middle of that. Uh, please uh, share with us uh, uh, the experiences of Mozambique uh, on, in this new environment of the pandemic. You have the floor, madam. Excellency and gentlemen, thank you for the the only national disaster risk reduction regional of the Africa to invite us to be part of the panel on and share our experience. World Health Organization declared of the COVID-19 as pandemic on 13 March 2020 on 22 March 2020, the government of Mozambique officially declared the first COVID-19 mm -hmm. as today, 27 July, Mozambique has twice the 669 confirmed cases and COVID and the 11 days of which 1,512 were local transmitted and uh, 157 important to Cap Delgado province. Currently, the epicenter of the outbreak in Mozambique with Pemba and Afunji resisting uh, more than 15% of the over case. Other affected provinces are Nampula, Niasa, Zambezia, Manica, Tete, Sofala, Nyambane, and uh, Maputo. So the president, Philip Jacinto Nusse, has declared a state of emerging beginning of the 1 of April and announcement a number of measures to contain the spread of the COVID-19, including the closed schools, mentoring, used masks, restrictions of public and private gathering, close or entertainment establishment, assemblies, bars, cinemas, and the nightclubs, and decide to provide financial assistance to support the private sector to cope with the economic impact of the pandemic. The state of emerging was recently extended until 31 July 2020. Assume the government uh, launched a set of measures to respond to this pandemic. The National of the Institute for the Development 
disaster uh, management, activate the 11 province operational emergency center, the 153 districts once on and the one Thursday, Thursday 42 local disaster risk management commitment to work to dissemination or prevention mentions to committees in collaboration with the health authorities. As part of the response of the COVID-19 prevention and mitigation plans have been development and have been implemented in different sectors through the Ministry of Health, Care, Unities and the Specialized Team were created across the country to serve 3,000 patients. So these response plans, the governments of Mozambique and partners aim to improve preparedness and the response capacity for COVID-19 in order to reduce the transmission associated the morbidity and mortality and uh, mitigate the impact of the outbreak. But all recognizing that uh, preparing and the response plans need to responsive to the population mobility and the cross border dynamics and the choose includes approach this into account local community and also we we look about for immigrants travels and displaced population are essential in the events of outbreak. Initial effort uh, focus our preparedness and the responses, but later the government priority responses to need to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic by incorporating elements of social question for in the inter strategy to for taking COVID-19. So about for the priority for this COVID people will strong to recover for the devastation roads by cyclones Idai and the Kenneth in 19 in 2019 as composed by the throw that we large strokes of the country and the terrorist attacks in Cap Delgado that led to displacement to throws the of people. Because the change in the humanitarian context to the vulnerable vulnerabilities generated by the COVID pandemic, the government strengthened the capacity of the provincial health authority in the day's partners and respond to the, the plans. And so this has enabled the provincial authority to strengthen community awareness to COVID-19 Prevention mentioned the National Institute for Disaster Management in a coordination the health sector training and the equipment local disaster, uh, disasters risk management committee for the to the work education, the public regarding prevention mission for COVID-19. In, in local language, um, and the uh, rural areas in, included the res resettlement sites that were created following the cyclones. 
So assessment of the chronogram of tropical cyclone Idai and Kenneth reconstruction process with, which uh, is currently underway. The aim of the, the, the determinate the amount of the time still needed to complete the reconstruction progress take, take, taking into account to impact of the COVID-19 and time twice being lost to the pandemic. And so this will enable to the government to fulfill the recover uh, committed to, to the population is to concern on the uh, and and uh, all activities with a directer impact of COVID uh, prevention and mitigation will be prioritized and increase especially uh, in the health wash and the education sector so basically uh, we need to will the sort become of the create importance as the consequence of the pandemic um, over the economic and social fabric has been severed. Therefore, mechanisms to weigh them, the support through social protection system and in place um, and eventually additional support will directly towards address people's basic needs. In this context, efforts uh, have been made to maintain and uh, reform social cohesion and the fearful uh, system to prevent social tension between individual and community experience as uh, seen of the inadequate and the uh, injustice this effort are uh, I met the refugees uh, internal displaced person and host communities but also women young and work in the informal sector among others this initiative take into account to possible complaints, discrimination, and uh, stigmatization about uh, sex to resource uh, life goals and health service. So, as I conclude, I would like to state that uh, the, despite the multiple changes enacted from various natural health social phenomena and COVID-19, the government of Mozambique has managed to navigate through this constraint in order to save lives and the state's development strategy. This is a result of the beta planning internal coordination and the participation of all stakeholders um, for Mozambique still need uh, external support to complete the reconstruction following the cyclones of 19. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. Um, so now um, we have some questions for you. So first of all, um, and I just wanted to underline uh, in your presentation, uh, Director General, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the challenges that you have in terms of social tensions between displaced communities, resettled communities, and, uh, uh, and their host communities, which is something that Katie mentioned earlier in, the, uh, in her presentation about some one of the challenges that we have in this uh, pandemic environment. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question for myself, actually, to begin with, before I go to the chats. And this is about um, the 
what I'm interested to know a little bit more about is the health authorities in many countries, particularly in Africa, which I know, have actually been, in most cases, leading the coordination and response uh, in many African countries. And I was wanting to understand a bit more in depth. I think I understand from Mr. Williams that maybe the NDMA is the one who's leading, or is it uh, a, a combination? My understanding from uh, Director General Louisa Mecca is that you're coordinating with the Minister of Health. So I'm just trying to understand uh, what kind of leadership role does the National Disaster Management Authority play in ensuring that the response to the pandemic is really a multi-sectoral, multi-hazard uh, uh, response rather than simply one that, uh, I'm not on the, uh, belittling it, but rather than simply one that is just uh, focusing on the health sector. So how are the other risks uh, brought in uh, by the NDMAs? And I open that question to uh, Dr. Jasim Henry or Madame Bekwe. Uh, Mr. Williams, you're muted. Yeah, okay. As I said before, um, the NDMA was taking the lead, the disaster management agency. And uh, we had that mechanism where we have, where we form clusters and we were, let's say, sort of taking the lead. But when the, the, the presidency got, so, so from that stage, the health ministry was taking the lead. Well, as I said before, for, for the NDMA, we became the, the co-lead in the IMS. And the IMS was the highest uh, decision-making body. Now, when the president came in again, the president thought that it was not only a health issue now, so they also formed a presidential task force, which was, yeah, which was another coordinating, uh, coordinating body. So it's like they were coordinating or looking after the non-health aspect of the fight. So they were like dealing with the general humanitarian um, um, interventions, okay, getting items, distributing, etc. especially where we are looking at the distribution of food to, to vulnerable communities or, or vulnerable individuals. So it's not only the, the, the health sector, but now when we go to these meetings in the health, se health sector, the other sectors are also part of it. For instance, the security sector, for instance, the, the, the educational sector, um, even it, we have what we call here the joint security. And the joint security is composed of the, the police, the army, um, the immigration. So this, all of these inputs we discuss, and it is the highest decision making body that's supposed to report to the president. So it's not only a health emergency now, it's really is a disaster and it costs across. Thank you, well noted. Uh, uh, Deputy Minister Jasin, please. Well, thank you very much. I think that the dealing with the pandemic is um, what's called an um, integrated management. And uh, we think that it's a multi-sectorial, like your Excellency said, a nation. It's not only uh, the role of the, of the health sector, but I think the health sectors, uh, by its uh, usual function as a preventive and uh, the curative action, I think it's not enough without the what's called the education or the awareness. Many, many uh, NGOs and um, uh, also the media playing a great role, especially in our society. We need much more awareness regarding the, the way of the transmission of the virus, how to protect themselves, and also we have a very good cooperation with the international organization, which is a multi, also multi-sectorial, not only with the WHO or UNICEF, but also with the UNDP, UNEP, with the uh, FAO and also UNDRR and also other uh, international uh, United Nations organization. And we have a very good uh, daily uh, uh, 
cooperation with the, our regional countries and also globally, uh, with the uh, John Hopkins Hospital Centers and also with the uh, Imperial College of London, also with Geneva, main office, and also with Korean side, Chinese, other countries. We have to uh, make some sort of uh, collaboration together, exchange the experience, because, you know, as the, uh, all of us facing this pandemic, we need to cooperate and collaborate together. And uh, on national, uh, really on a na national level, this is the first time really we are working in what's called a teamwork, multi-sectorial teamworks, not only on the ministerial level, but also on the social level, uh, people, the young people, especially gender involvement in, in facing this pandemic, which is a very important for us. And uh, really they play a great role in, in the awareness, especially, you know, uh, we have special concern and focusing about the awareness in facing this pandemic, because we, we think that the awareness playing more than the curative and preventive aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director General McQuay, would you like to come in or? I can come back to you if you wish. You're muted. You're muted again, yeah. No. Okay, so thank you for to come, come back for us. For the, our experience in Mozambique, the problem it, it, it is, is not, to, it's not so easy to explain because the, uh, I know um, the challenge is, uh, it is very hard for us because the, the, this, uh, this moment is the uh, important moment to, to, to make the, some decision for our team. So we know uh, in this case, we, we have the same problem for the, um, uh, for the, um, some people's died for the all the, uh, the world. But the, our um, institutes now, when we, 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 can, we, we, we make now, it is some uh, assistant for the humanity for the um, uh, assistant for the humanity for the um, in the community because in the, this time we need to make the assistant for the all the people we need when they 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 need they need the assistant so about for the health the i know we know so uh, in this case the um, the minister of health the um, they make all the tests and make some um, activity in the in the fields to arrangement so what the, give the hours the numbers of the case in, in Mozambique. So ours, um, our 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 experience or our role now is to to coordinate and have the have the big challenge with the, the government because we know it is very 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 um, difficult to and uh, difficult to decision to make the decision for the, this time. So what I I, uh, I think in this case it is um, it is the first case in all the uh, the world for the covid-19 it is some uh, case it is not a, a, it is one case uh, new so if this case is not the normally in the, the in the world so we don't have the experience another experience for the, this case the same the same case so <laughs> i don't know what i can say so maybe the coordinate of the old uh, activity when we, I, we do with the, uh, all the ministers in the Mozambique, we can improve the, the, the solution for the, this, this problem. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if I can, can I come in a bit? Yes, Mr. Williams, go ahead. Okay, you, um, you see, another problem, you, you see with coordination, um, especially in issues like this, the presidency sometimes have the say. And uh, as for us, um, we rely on maybe regional, regional assistance on coordination, for instance, from the OEU or from the UNDDR our African um, office. Mm -hmm. So, um, because we also wait for them to maybe sort of give us some direction or something that we can lean on. Especially now we have a, a multiple disaster issue in Liberia. Okay, apart from the corona, we have the natural disaster of flooding and, and flash floods, etc. So now we are dealing with all of the issues and we need, um, um, I hate to say this when we are discussing generally about capacity, but where capacity is low, I mean, your involvement is also low. So um, we are facing that problem, but we try to, let's say, work with the coordination team, but not as the head, but as part of the system. So really, this is, this is where we are. So I just wanted to, to throw that in. Yeah, not as the head, but part of the system. I, I want to give uh, the opportunity also to uh, Ronald Jackson and SRSG, if you want to come in, uh, uh, of, uh, if you have any queries or observations that you would like to make uh, now that we have the directors of these various disaster management or risk management uh, entities. If you would like to come in, uh, uh, please, you're welcome to do so. I, I can ask another question and give you time to think about it if you wish. <laughs> uh, if, you go if, ahead, Ron. If the SRSG isn't going to go out, I'm certainly keen on, on offering some reflections from, uh, and, and it came out, I think, in, in the case of um, Sir Williams's contributions around how the government would have gone about um, organizing their response to the COVID-19 amidst the other challenges. And it's certainly something we're seeing globally um, where there are these seemingly parallel systems um, that are being established to deal with the pandemic. Um, despite the fact that the, the NDMAs are involved the, there are parallel tracks set up within perhaps the office of the prime minister or the presidency that, that seeks to uh, mobilize another arm of coordination. And I think this is something that we have to, we have to examine to understand um, how this interplay takes place within one or intent to strengthen the NDMAs to be able to deal with more uh, complex issues that are going to come and to ensure that we address some of the issues around the, the dissonance between some of the policy and practice um, that, that can occur. Um, and you know, this is, is coming out uh, very much in these case studies and it's something we've seen in many regions around the world, not just in, not just in Africa, in, in, in many countries. And I think this is something we have to look at, um, particularly as UNDP and UNDRR in partnership, because as the SRSG said in our opening remarks, this is certainly something that would have been outlined within the Sendai, where the pandemic issues are part of the, the multi-hazard spectrum within which we, we are promoting an integrated risk management context. But we are seeing the practice sometimes suggesting that the systems we've built to deal with the multi-hazard context is not appropriate for tackling these challenges. And it's something we really have to, we really have to look back at it to examine what are the points of departure. Um, Katie, in her comments, talked about the, in, the issues of politics. She said, power, politics, and risk governance. And I think that's a very important leading to understand what we see happening um, where these um, 
parallel, somewhat parallel systems are being set up. Even as much as we see the legislation, the disaster management legislations being used to respond to and recover from these, these, these issues. So that's an, an early reflection um, linking some of the things we're seeing globally we're getting in the case studies here um, from, from our colleagues in Africa. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Ronald. Um, so I'm Jed, um, very much um, related to what Ronald just mentioned and also to what um, uh, Katie mentioned about the opportunity to look, look into the complexity of issues and um, the system risk. Um, I do feel that as difficult as, as this is, it is a true opportunity to uh, have a multi-hazard approach. When uh, COVID-19 started, UNDRR uh, started to uh, look into um, how many countries actually have biological hazards within uh, their national strategy. There are currently 82 countries which have a national strategy uh, to some degree aligned to the Sendai framework. And what we found out was that really not many countries yet have a multi-hazard approach. It's still very much the single hazard approach. Um, and we know now that um, that's not gonna work. But then I was encouraged to hear that um, the, um, uh, and Mr. Williams said that uh, you used the clusters to deal with the issue, you know, health cluster, shelter cluster, private sector, which is also bringing the multi-hazard uh, and also multi-sectoral um, and also uh, all of society approach uh, to dealing with it. And when, um, uh, the Deputy uh, Minister, um, uh, His Excellency from Iraq mentioned that you have repositioned your priorities to look at health, nature, uh, biological diversity in water. That also means that you are looking at uh, issues that are connected and you have to look at it together, uh, which is very much the case. And also when um, Ms. Meke uh, was referring uh, to uh, uh, how you were looking at the issues of displacement, how were you looking at the issue of um, uh, the uh, vulnerable people uh, being discriminated, stigmatized. Now, this is also an approach that brings in uh, the whole society together. So uh, really, you know, listening to um, uh, all uh, three of the distinguished um, um, panelists, I do feel that uh, we really shouldn't uh, lose this opportunity. Um, sometimes, you know, because one disaster comes and then another comes, um, and because we get so busy responding, and it, it is totally understandable, as Mr. Williams said, capacity is not high. But I do really feel that we need to seize this opportunity to have this multi-sectoral, multi-hazard approach. And maybe because in your countries where you have such a fragile context, you understand the importance of the connectiveness of these issues more than other countries. So in a way, I was very encouraged to listening uh, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saraji. Uh, Katie, would you like to, um, do you have any observations? Because I'm going to close soon. Uh, thank you. Um, there was one thing actually I just wanted to pick up on that I don't think we've spoken about much yet. That is that the pandemic, but also the responses to the pandemic are already having significant implications on economies world over from, you know, from the local to the global level. And that's also going to have a cascading impact, not only on resources for risk management in the future, but also on patterns um, of poverty and of conflict. And I think that's something that we need to be thinking about a bit more seriously. Um, there's a lot of analysis at the moment that is pointing to a very bleak future. Uh, so, for example, the World Bank have projected 40 to 60 million people are going to be pushed into extreme poverty just in 2020 alone. Um, and many of those are in conflict contexts. And we've already seen, for example, um, income losses and food insecurity have sparked violence and unrest in Kenya and in India and Honduras. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of questions to be asked around how sort of changing economic uh, availability of economic resources is going to have implications not only on poverty but as I say also on conflict because something that we can learn from is we've obviously been talking about what we can learn from uh, in a pandemic perspective for example from SARS and Ebola etc in terms of dealing with COVID um, and future threats but there's also a lot that we can learn for from how global recessions 
um, have impacted availability of financing for peace. So for example, in 2008, the financial crisis resulted in the UN peacekeeping facing cuts of 20%. Um, and it's very likely that we're going to see something similar again in the future. So all of that, I guess, just to say that we need to be thinking not only about the implications of the pandemic for disaster risk managers, but for risk management more broadly. Um, and to do that, we need to be thinking about a whole range of issues that goes beyond just shocks and stresses and, and hazards that we're used to thinking about. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. That was very good uh, to know. Uh, I I, I, before I close, there is one more question I have to entertain from uh, from outside, and it's addressed to the heads of the um, uh, our, our, co our colleagues from the uh, uh, from the national governments. Uh, it says experience from uh, previous disasters, like the ones highlighted by Mr. Williams and Mrs. Meke, uh, provide a strong foundation for future disaster response. But they're saying countries cannot wait to get hit by disaster to learn. How can other countries draw from your experiences? So if I had to, uh, maybe Mr. Williams, uh, Dr. Jasim, I mean, if you had to give one, one good lesson for people to take away in terms of uh, disaster yeah, reduction it, and response, what would that be? I know you okay. have many, but let's do one. Um, Go ahead. Maybe what I could say is that um, the only way you can, let's say, benefit from past experience is to sustain what you have. So mm -hmm. if that sustainability and that, um, let's say, response or preparedness um, attitude is embedded in your plans, then it will help. But if you forget about what you have done, and you see, disaster is one thing we cannot forget about disaster. Disaster will come at any time. So I think uh, systems that have been built need to be maintained and they need to be sustained. If not, it will not work. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jassim. Well, thank you very much, Lady. The, what I want to say is that uh, we cannot success without our working as a team. I think pandemic COVID-19, one of the most important lessons till now is we should work together. And I'm, I'm insisting about this issue. We should be working uh, together as, as a nation globally. We are working as a, as a planet, as a human being. We should start together to, to cooperate. And I think the world before COVID-19 is uh, def definitely differ completely from uh, post COVID-19. The most important issue that I want to insist upon that we should we should make a great link between the COVID-19 disaster with other crises like climate change uh, to work as what's called a multi uh, hazard sectors, which is important for us, especially on our national. Um, now, really, if we had an integrated global management for pandemic of COVID-19, we should think about the water security, food security, health security, which is called the medical therapeutics. And you know, when all the world has been blocked, we are suffering a lot how to make some sort of transportation for the medical equipment, how to protect our medical employees, how to deal with our patients, now, really, there is a great uh, pressure upon the uh, medical equipment and also the medicine, oxygen, which is a very, it's a vital for the people who are suffering from infection with COVID-19. Now we are doing our best. This is a great lesson for us as a human being that we should put our consideration on very important and basic things that we should nationalize the uh, what's called the medical therapeutic industries. It's a very important for us. One of the most important lessons that we are working now as a government is to make some, some sort of what's called nationalization of the uh, medical equipment. And uh, we should depend upon ourselves. Uh, the uh, independency is very important in some sectors that we think before that the, uh, the world become as a village, but the blockade make a great challenges for us 
for our very important things and vital. And now we can exchange. Now our neighbors, we are working together in cooperation with Kuwait, with the Iranian side, Jordanian, Turkish side, also with our uh, regional area. They are working, we are working as a network, but I think that the United Nations organization play a great role in what's called the organization of the multi, uh, multi-hazard sectors. I think this is the new approach and from our national, from our governmental sectors, we are ready to support and to uh, push forward any efforts in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Deputy Minister uh, Dr. Yassim. Uh, Ms. Bueke, any, anything from your side in terms of a, a specific takeaway or a lesson uh, learned that people could uh, take away from this presentation? But you are muted. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. So I hope for the we we hope to 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 have the uh, um, a big collaboration. It is the most of the this big big challenge we need to have. And uh, for the, how our how our how our, um, our responsibility is big is too big because we need to have the uh, need to uh, sensibility for the the people we need to have need to the the communication for the all the 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 risks the of the pandemic in in in, in our countries mm. so uh, i hope that the the, the first when i need it to communicate uh, for the our people to use the mask and to to know how the important for the how to the, the put the people need to to use the mask mm -hmm. because sometimes we told all time all the time for the use the mask but the message sometimes is not um which for them it will not the the, the 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 it's not the reach for the the people so we need to improve and we need to increase our communication for the use for the mask i i think this is the importance for the message we need to stay until the community and use the local language because the people need to understand what is importance, what is this dangerous disease. And for, for this time, I need to um, to to say thank you for this opportunity and for the we we, we continue to collaborate and this state this team. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. I will thank uh, everybody. I will, uh, and just to what, so what I found um, interesting, thank you all for the teamwork, the awareness raising that you mentioned, the process of teamwork, and Mr. Williams, the importance of building on existing systems and making them stronger. Um, I think one thing that this, uh, your presentations have really uh, brought to mind, for me at least, is that, as I said earlier, we sometimes have uh, difficulties in, in, in the political buying for disastrous reduction in the traditional sense. But what's interesting in all your presentations is that you had that political buying in terms of uh, the pandemic at the highest level from the president of the country. And now all we need to do is take that opportunity, and we've said opportunity many times, take that opportunity and turn it into a multi-hazard 
uh, uh, response coordination, multi-hazard, multi-sectoral response uh, to uh, to to disaster risk reduction or or to the pandemic as as well as the disaster risk reduction management as a whole. So I would like to thank everybody. I don't know if SRG you want to say something before I shut down. Uh, no, just to really um, thank. Um, uh, all the uh, participants to this webinar and again um, really you know um, reminding us of uh, the plight of the states in fragile context and we need to uh, keep on uh, working on that specific issue and as I mentioned in my uh, remarks at the beginning uh, we will uh, keep on working on uh, the triple nexus and we look forward to working with uh, Katie on this and then also um, with the UNDP with which we have a very strong partnership now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, SRG. Ronald, uh, we, you are new here. This is your first, I guess, <laughs> one of the earliest opportunities that you've had to interact with our group. So maybe a few words of commitment <laughs> from your side to our uh, colleagues and these national governments who have been so uh, forthcoming and sharing their experiences with us. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the SRSG um, and yourself, Amjad, and all of the speakers uh, for what I thought was a extremely valuable exchange of experiences, but also providing inputs into what I think are continuously complex challenges that we're facing. Um, the DRT team and indeed the entire UNDP um, in its new pathway in looking at risk-informed development, but also its partnership with UNDRR, something we're, we're very committed to not only within the global team, but also within our regional teams to really see how we bring um, continued uh, delivery of the Sendai framework and also our efforts within the Agenda 2030. Um, we will be working very closely with, with our UNDR, our colleagues on these issues. Um, and um, we're, we're looking forward to, to the partnership, um, both globally and, and at the country, country office level. Thank you very much, um, and I look forward to working with you in the weeks, months, and years to come. Inshallah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, okay, um, I just wanted to thank you, Director General Luisa, uh, Director uh, Mr. Henry Williams, uh, Deputy Minister Dr. Jasim, uh, Katie, it was wonderful to have you. Uh, special thanks uh, to you and the RR colleagues here in Africa office who uh, have prepared this, uh, organized this uh, meeting, UNDP for your uh, close collaboration and your team, uh, Ronald, who helped us a lot uh, on this. And uh, just to announce that we'll also provide a, an issues brief uh, as a, that uh, outlines the, the, risk, the, make, the key areas that we discussed in this meeting. And last but not least, I really want to thank all the participants who have uh, shared uh, their views in the chat. Uh, it was excellent to have over 100 people who are with us uh, most of the time. So special thanks to all the participants who have joined us and, and uh, I hope we can work together with you as well in promoting disaster risk reduction efforts, even in this very challenging times. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Assalamu. Thank you very much, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>